along the top here we have group switches so you can power down the group now um, if we look at the main board here you can see we've got one ISA slot that this board is in got a second ISA slot there's this thing here that looks suspiciously like an extended ISA or an ESA slot uh, this is called a shunt slot and then we have two more 16-bit uh, ISA slots and the shunt slot allows you to join the buses together so uh, by default they're segregated two and two and two and two like I said if you put a shunt board in the slot that'll join the adjacent buses uh, and a shunt board looks like this Which again suspiciously easy like uh, I had this machine bought in 2002 I believe and uh, even though this was end of life by then I was able to call Cubix I believe I paid two bucks fifty for the shunt boards. They just sent them out to me, no questions. They were exceptionally helpful. Uh, they're real nice, friendly people. Um, the KVM cable, which I have mine here, uh, usually you have a box that mounts on the back on our little connectors here. In my case, however, I did not have the box, and the charges for the boxes were horrendously expensive, probably because they were going to have to custom make them, so I made my own cable. And it, frankly, I didn't remember it looking this god awful. But, uh, well, there you go. Mouse, keyboard, nice and clear. So we've got our DB25, the uh, terrifying wiring there, and our video hookup. The pinouts for this, they gave me. I called Cubix and I said, hey, I'd really like to build one of these. I'm not going to buy one. I can't afford it. I'm just a hobbyist. And they emailed me the KVM breakout. So, I mean, I like this company. Uh, the boards themselves are 486s. Rather interesting. And if we pop one out here, a bit of a shot of it. So much easier when you have two hands. Um, my machine came with seven boards and a supervisor board. Uh, we'll talk about the supervisor in a second, but uh, I no longer have it in here. I didn't need the supervisor. I didn't have the software. So what I did is, you can see that this has a much larger processor socket on it. This is actually a, was it 133 megahertz? I can't read it clearly. I'm sorry. I should have done the research beforehand. But it's an overdrive chip in a socket with uh, its own power regulation, things like that, that'll mount into a for its socket that'll overclock it. These are 33 megahertz for 86s, so obviously this is a big step up. This was the master node in the system, but the damn riser is so high that I needed this uh, shunt slot in here so that I could fit the Ethernet controller. Uh, so I uh, jimmied this up and lost the supervisor board, which, as I wasn't using it, as I said, wasn't a huge loss. So we have four 30 pin uh, SIMs. It was capable of up to 16 megs. We've got our 33 megahertz VX. Oak Technology Video Controller. So we've got uh, all of this makes up the controller here. DAC, Video RAM. We have our 16 C552. That's the twin port serial controller. Megatrains keyboard. Megatrains BIOS. That is the floppy drive controller. Um, I haven't actually located the hard disk controller on this. I'm embarrassed to say. I don't think it's integrated with this, but it might be. The OPD, there's three of them here, was part of what's called a NEAT chipset. Uh, it's an integrated AT chipset. Uh, it was originally done by PC chips, but what it does is it allows you to cut down on the IC count on a board. Instead of having lots of chips like these, where uh, you would have one for the real-time clock and one for the interrupt controller and all these things, they group them together into two, in this case three, and there's my phone, very large ICs. Uh, the two ones that we have here have a clock generator. We've got a bus controller, my phone again. We've got timer controller, interrupt controller, DMA controller, NVRAM, real-time clock, part of the memory controller, 
and then an 8255 parallel controller. This third chip uh, gives a second part to the memory controller and it allows it to do shadow RAM. The um, whole thing, completely standalone as I said, runs off a passive AT bus. Uh, this was uh, the first blades that they made really, uh, as far as I can tell. The later ones, they came in dual Pentiums, dual Celerons, things like that. I think the highest model they made allowed for dual Pentium 2s. So, although this is an early, early system with the 486s, they went right ahead and into the late 90s they were still producing these with much newer hardware. They eventually fell by the wayside. What they started focusing on was their um, bus extension capabilities. What Cubic sells these days are PCIe, PCIx bus extensions. Uh, like my magma machine which I showed you on the basement tour. Um, what you do is you stick the extender card in your PCIe slot and it has a cable that goes at the back to another little box which has its own integrated um, two slot PCIe bus and it has a power supply in it so you just plug into the wall. Uh, I'm not sure what the cable length is, probably not going to be too long, but then instead of, you know, your machine might only have a single PCIe slot, instead of being tied to that one slot, you now have two slots so that you can use, uh, for example, a SLI uh, dual video card or something like that. I spoke to a chap at Cubix uh, by the name of Jim, and I put to him, you know, you guys pretty much invented uh, blade computing like this. Uh, and nobody knows who you are, you know. Um, nobody knows the Cubic's name, which is tremendously unfortunate. And IBM's really known as the starter of this, uh, what is now ubiquitous um, computing model. How do you guys feel about this? And he was very stoic and he said, you know, what are you going to do about it? Um, and I guess I applaud that. Um, like I said, they moved on to the PCI bus extenders, so they have gone on. Uh, I do have um, some evidence of an earlier proto-blade design. A friend of mine in Florida by the name of Dave McGuire was working at um, data centers, and they were running out of space for computers, and so he decided that it would be smart to utilize existing Sun technology and they took a whole bunch of single board VME uh, Sun processors, I think they were 360s, as in a Sun 3 slash 60 boards, and they stuck them in a VME chassis. Uh, and if that sounds familiar, if we make a quick run over here, it should because that's exactly what this is here. We have big VME chassis. 19 inch rack mount form factor and these are Sun 360's. Now these, this may even be one of his machines. I don't know. They weren't labeled as you can see this is completely you know off the shelf technology uh, or at least um, generic technology. But instead of having uh, a whole bunch of pizza boxes stacked up or uh, one U2 your machines um, we have a whole bunch of blades and these uh, booted off the network. Uh, they did not have the ability to put a disc on board. You can see the too thin and two and a half inch disc really didn't exist back then. So uh, it could be argued that this was probably the very first implementation of anything that could be described as a blade. But when it comes to off the shelf technology, a corporation producing it specifically for the purpose, here we have it right here. <laughs> 